Well, Tom, such a pleasure to have you here on the Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation Podcast. And for folks who are unfamiliar, do you mind introducing yourself and sharing with us a little bit about what it is that you do? For sure. Well, thank you for having me, Corey. It's wonderful to, to get to be on the show. And thank you for all the work you're doing, uh, sharing stories of social entrepreneurs and inspiring more people to create action, mm-hmm. to take action, to create change. Uh, that's what we do at Start Some Good as well. Uh, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of a social enterprise called Start Some Good. And our mission is to increase the pace of innovation for social change. And we do that by helping people get ideas out of their heads and into the real world so that they can make a difference. And so we focus on inspiring um, people to take action helping them design that action, you know, create a, a meaningful plan that can succeed, and then helping them launch and go to market, uh, including through our crowdfunding platform at startsomegood.com. Also uh, through a number of accelerators that we run on behalf of partners across uh, uh, corporates, foundations, government, uh, and, and quite a lot of capacity building work and coaching. Mm, excellent. And so from, from what I could gather right off the, the front page of uh, start some good site. Y'all have been responsible for funding through the crowdfunding platform. Uh, over a thousand projects. I think it was 1100 exactly right now. And uh, over $11 million ha- have been yep. raised for those projects. So I'm yeah, so far. curious to hear just to start, what, what's that like to kind of amass such figures and now mm-hmm. about roughly, what is it? Eight, eight or so years uh, mm-hmm. into start yeah. some good. How, how does it feel to, to be in that moment? It's surreal, to be honest, you know, everything, I kind of can't believe it's been as long as it has. It's, it's gone by very quickly. Um, as anyone who's working you know, in a startup knows, time seems to, to move very quickly as you're, as you're trying to make things happen. Um, in some ways, we've, we've come further and done more than I anticipated. In other ways, we're nowhere near where I thought we'd be uh, when, I, when, when, I, when we started out. I, I'm fueled by unrealistic expectations. Uh, really, so everything everything in, I've ever done in my whole life has turned out to be harder and longer than I anticipated <laughs> when I start. When I start, I think in some ways that that kind of permanent naivety is a little bit of my strength. If I was completely realistic about what was involved, I'd probably throw myself into to fewer things and, and right. may never have started to start some good. Um, but no, it feels really good. I, I have to say, I, in kind of at a previous point in my life, I was I've always been very focused on social change since a teenager. Um, that's been my whole career, but that, that's taken somewhat different forms. At, at an earlier stage, I was more focused on political activism. Um, and, and, and at some point, kind of in my 20s, switch, switched over to focusing on social entrepreneurship. Um, partly because I got really sick of, you know, this, this model of change, which I, I totally believe in. So huge, huge respect for the activists out there. It is incredibly important. But that is so focused on convincing other people to do the right thing. You know, convincing legislators and, and politicians to, to do what you want to do. And at a certain point... I think just in terms of my personality and what I like, I'm like, oh, I'm so sick of trying to talk people into things. What can I just do? What are the, you know, what are the tools that we have at our, at our disposal right now to create the changes our communities need with or without the permission um, from, you know, from external people, government, et cetera. And, I, and I'm very grateful for that, I think, particularly in Australia, um, where I am based at the moment, we work globally, um, but I'm in Australia. Our politics is pretty slow moving. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly far, you know, far too slow to respond to many of the kind of challenges that confront us right now. And I think that if I was still completely focused in that activism world, I'd be incredibly frustrated um, and, and maybe, you know, depressed and a bit fearful about the future. But that's impossible doing the work we do because every day we meet people, you know, who are passionate and committed and, and, and taking action, getting on with the, the work of creating a better future. And so I know that, you know, uh, it's not just the people we meet, of course, I know that they represent a huge movement out there of, of good people using their entrepreneurial skills and their creativity to try and do new things that make a difference. And so that really keeps me feeling optimistic, despite all the, you know, the shocks to the system and the challenges we have at the moment. So I'm incredibly grateful for that. That's the best thing about the work that we do. Hmm. Excellent. And I mean, whether you, you think it's, it's been slow or slower than you like or not, I, I think that the figures and accomplishments of Start Some Good are are really rather impressive. And so I'm wondering what, what do you think has led, and I'm sure there's a combination of factors, but mm-hmm. what, what do you think is, has led to such uh, um, prolific accomplishment over this, this last, eight, last eight years and, and mm-hmm. now having touched so many different social impact projects and, and enterprises? I mean, I think it's because it's what the world needs. Mm. I, I genuinely believe that. that's why, that's why we started. Um, I mean, to give a bit of context, you know, as I said, I've always worked in kind of social change and I've previously founded three not-for-profits and a couple of social enterprises, um, all of which gave me a lot of experiences with, you know, 
a lot of personal experience with the challenge of raising money, building communities, getting things off the ground. But I didn't really have a kind of a kind of a, a systems perspective on that. I just had my own, you know, my own battles, my own my own hard work. Um, mm. And it's hard to know how represented that is. You know, you have kind of a sample size of one yourself, and it's like, is this hard because it's hard? Is it hard because I'm not very good at it? Mm-hmm. And so it was actually when I moved to the US in 2008 and spent a couple of years working for an organization called Ashoka that really kind of pulled my perspective up to this more kind of kind of systems level. And I realized that a lot of the difficulties I experienced weren't just because I, you know, it wasn't just because it's kind of a hard thing to do and I wasn't good enough at it, but actually that there's some real kind of gaps in the system when it comes to social innovation. And one of those really significant gaps is around the, the funding of innovation, mm. that we're really bad at funding innovation in the social sector. And you compare that to how they, you know, the, the kind of the role that angel investors play in the commercial startup world, who are essentially paying for the experiments. Mm. You know, what a lot of people who are kind of outside the startup world don't realize is they think that that you raise investment after you become investable. In fact, it's the other way around. Most companies raise investment first and then use that money to become investable, mm-hmm. which feels like a paradox, you know, because you have to raise money pre any conventional notion of, of investability, really, you know, pre before you have real metrics that justify that. But how do you collect metrics? That requires running pilots, doing MVPs, you know, producing something, trying to sell it, mm-hmm. testing the interactions people are having with it, uh, validating that people are willing to pay for it and all of that costs money and so in the commercial sector you know and uh, they I think have a you know it's kind of simple to balance the risk and reward trade-offs mm-hmm. of innovation because every business has the same set of metrics profit and loss you know return mm-hmm. on investment it's just and so you know so an angel investor you know will invest in very early stage companies completely comfortable with the knowledge that 95% of them will fail um, in most cases but hoping that one of them will be the next Airbnb mm-hmm. or Uber or Dropbox or whatever. And we know that if that company returns at least 100x its initial investment, voila, the whole portfolio is is balanced and in profit. Right. It's hard to do that equivalent for social change. What's it look like to invest in 100 early stage ideas for social change, have 95% of them completely not work, four of them be okay, but one of them be a, a profound breakthrough in an area of need. Does that balance the portfolio? No one really knows how to think about that because it doesn't come down to this one, you know, metric to, to rule them all mm-hmm. um, that, that it does in the commercial sector. And so it was actually when I was in San Francisco that I got thinking about that a lot. After after two years in DC with a show where I moved to San Francisco and was working for a startup that was building software and providing consulting and support for social enterprises and not-for-profits to, to use social media. And then I moved to a, a kind of social change innovation lab down in the valley called Hope Lab. Um, And that really gave me an appreciation for the first time of what a pro-innovation ecosystem looks like. I don't think I'd ever kind of really seen or experienced it, but it looks like people willing to take risks. It looks like people understanding that the goal is to create breakthroughs, not just to kind of, you know, increment your way towards a better future. Because I ultimately don't think we can just increment our way towards a better future. Mm -hmm. And I kind of realized that when you look at the social sector, it's a world of all VCs and no angels. No, in the commercial startup sector, the angels take those incredible risks and can reap incredible rewards when they get it right. And then the VCs are investing other people's money, and this is the really important distinction, and therefore have to be able to justify their decisions to the people providing that money, right. and therefore need to be able to point it down. They can't just go, oh, I just had a feeling. I just, I, just, you know, I just had a good feeling about this team, or I just think this is fascinating. I want to see where it goes. They have to say, well, look at the, look at the numbers. It makes sense. It, it meets our investment thesis. Um, and I realized that the social change sector is essentially all VCs and no angels. Almost everyone's investing in someone else's money, mm. you know, working for a foundation or working for government or even when it is a, a high network individual, they're not normally the person doing the meetings. That's someone who is, you know, right. working for their family office or representing them. And so all these people are even, people of very good will trying to do, trying to do good, but also trying to look sensible, seem smart, not make mistakes, you know, not, not look foolish in front of their stakeholders. And so everyone's trying to do the most good they can do. But in the social sector, that's come to mean, in most cases, the most good we can be certain is going to happen. Mm. Like, show me your impact model. Show me your impact metrics. If I give you X dollars, you have to promise me that you'll create Y outcome. Mm. And, of course, that's not how innovation works. Innovation is experimentation. And so kind of, you know, after spending a little bit of time in San Francisco and observing this dynamic, I began, you know, began to kind of, uh, I guess, kind of solidify in my head that this is one of the key gaps that is preventing us from innovating in the way that we need to in a world that itself changes as fast as it does now. Um, and I thought, well, how else, you know, what are some other models for funding early stage 
pro projects other than just this conventional angel invest investor model. And I got really inspired by Kickstarter mm. at the time, who I thought was solving a very similar problem, um, which is that the creative industries had always been a world of gatekeepers. You know, you couldn't get your music out if you didn't get a record label on board. You couldn't, no one would see your art if you couldn't convince a gallery to hang it. There were all these kind of gatekeepers in the industry that stood between creators and audiences. Mm. Um, and Kickstarter, along with a bunch of other social technologies and so on, created pathways around those gatekeepers where artists could build communities directly with the people who most enjoyed their art and wanted to see them make more of it. And that could allow them to, you know, to progress and to produce and to build businesses without necessarily needing to convince those, those gatekeepers first. Um, and I thought that's exactly what's going on in the social sector as well. It's a world of gatekeepers who are represented by foundations and governments and you know, corporate supporters, um, they're, they're very risk averse. They're not very good at predicting the future. They're not very good at, at picking what's next. So mm -hmm. how do we build a pathway around that? And could we using crowdfunding kind of fill a little bit of that kind of risk tolerant capital gap for interesting early stage ideas? And, and crowdfunding does that really effectively. And it, it does that essentially by breaking it down to each of our individual acceptable risk level. You know, you might have a really cool idea. I but no matter how interesting it is, I couldn't give you $50,000. That's far too risky mm -hmm. for me. But maybe I could give right. you $500 or $50 if I think it's exciting. And if it doesn't work, you know, okay, well, that's, you know, we all learned something and we gave it a good go. And at the end of the day, I only lost $50 or $100 or whatever I thought I could afford. And so it becomes, of course, a lot easier to, to be adventurous, to be visionary, to take risks, to support more innovative projects. If you're not the only one responsible, you're one of 100 or one of 1,000 people who are all chipping in to the extent that they can. Hmm. So that's how we came to launch a crowdfunding site. Hmm. And uh, what I love about Start Some Good is that you, you really are cultivating a whole ecosystem for these, these early stage uh, social impact projects and enterprises. Uh, you have uh, uh, the Good Hustle program as well, mm -hmm. which is more of the, the strategy and the, the tactics and then the crowdfunding, yeah, the funding, uh, kind of having that built in there. And then your um, annual summit, your virtual summit, kind of inspiration and, and looking mm -hmm. up at a lot of these, these really prolific folks in the space. Uh, what, what has you so excited about these early stage social impact projects? I mean, I just think, you know, that, that the social sector and, and all of us really, you know, need to build a skill set around innovation. You know, the world, the, the, the way we traditionally fund social change based on that's not to say there isn't, of course, an important role for, for evidence and, and measurement, mm -hmm. you know, impact measurement and so on. And of course, that's, that's really important when you're looking at scaling stuff up. Um, but we're not very good at collecting that data because we're not very good at supporting projects that don't yet have it. Mm. Um, and so I'm just very convinced that, that, that we, you know, one of the great needs we have is, for, is, is, to, is to build a more vibrant innovation ecosystem for social change. And that's because the world itself simply moves too fast. Mm. You know, the old practice of like, let things slowly prove themselves. And then only once they've proved themselves, you know, kind of scanning up and so on. That's, that's fit for a world that, that evolves a lot slower, but the way the world changes today and gosh, this year has just been an incredible example of that, yeah. isn't it? But you know, who knows what 2021 will bring. I don't want to freak <laughs> anyone out, but this could just be, you know, what life is like. We, we live at a, in a time of accelerating change. And in a time of rapid change, you can't rely on the things that were proven to work yesterday and assume that they're going to work tomorrow. You need to be constantly innovating, constantly testing. Um, and, and like I said, it's just not something that we've, we've traditionally kind of breaks some of our traditional, there is, a, there is a, a natural conservatism in the social sector that comes from a good place. It's people wanting to, you know, very desperate to not waste their resources, very desperate to, to help people who need help. And there's so much need out there that it creates this, this kind of, um, this, this, conservatism based on a desire to do good and therefore to support things that you know will do good. But it means that everyone is kind of constantly trying to get on first base. Everyone is taking the certain over the possible. Mm. Um, and so we really felt like, you know, and we feel like all of our work is helping people focus on the possible and focus on the innovation um, that, that we need. And we think the best innovation comes from people who are living in, in those, you know, in community and who are experiencing various social challenges who have a lived experience and, and, and therefore can see how things could be better or, or, or what need, you know, what's needed in their community. But unfortunately, many of those people with lived experiences don't come necessarily kind of neatly prepackaged with the perfect kind of MBA skills 
mm. to pitch, to, to build, you know, business models and to pitch ideas. And so that's partly why we ended up doing more of this, you know, of building this, this wider ecosystem that you mentioned just before, because our, you know, we believe that, you know, if, it's, if increasing innovation requires supporting what we call grassroots innovators, you can't just hand them a set of tools, mm. which is kind of what a lot of crowdfunding is. It's like, here's a cool set of tools that you can use to build community and raise funds. Good luck with those. <laughs> um, and maybe here's a manual that we pre-wrote. So, you know, read the manual, use the tools. And that will work for some people, um, but not for everyone. It's a little bit like, you know, a lot of crowdfunding platforms are a little bit like showing someone into a room that's filled with wood and hammers and nails and saws and, and saying, make me a table. Mm. Now, we're all experts at tables. You're sitting at one right now. I'm standing at one. Like, we use tables every day. So we're all much more expert at tables than we are at crowdfunding, <laughs> um, probably. But knowing how a table looks and works is not the same as being able to put one together. And, you know, I'm sure many of you and many of your listeners may be more handy than me, but I, I literally couldn't build that table if my life depended on it. The only way I could begin to build that table is by having someone there helping coach me through the, at least the early stages, even if everything I needed was already in the room. And that's a bit how crowdfunding works, you know, like people show people into a room essentially that has, here's all the tools you need, here's a manual, you know, here's some self-service tools, uh, hopefully you'll figure it out, good luck with that. Mm. Um, and unfortunately it means that a lot of very worthy ideas um, don't end up emerging and don't succeed because the person with that idea doesn't kind of doesn't have the skills and hasn't been taught how to how to kind of frame their pitch, how to identify their, their target market, and how to kind of introduce this idea to people in a way that they kind of respond to. And that's why we've we've ended up moving over time much more into capacity building and coaching. Mm -hmm. um, we're not really. It's interesting, you know, because crowdfunding is of course a platform business, but how platform businesses work is is a high volume, low touch. That's, you know, the economics of it is to, is to you know, click the ticket and a pretty slim margin across. And so you, you try and operationalize to enormous scale right. with, as, as, with as little interaction with your users as possible is how you build. And we just never wanted to do that. You know, this is my own, again, naivety, not really understanding the business <laughs> I was getting into, that, that while we were excited about the idea of crowdfunding, we weren't, I think, kind of culturally or attitudinally cut out to run a platform business in that way because we're too interested in people. And we wanted mm. to help people learn how to crowdfund not just handling the tools. So we always had this unusually high touch approach on our platform that was like, you know, we have, we have a team of, of crowdfunding coaches and every project that every draft that starts on our site, a, crowd, a, a specific crowdfunding coach reaches out and says, you know, fantastic, welcome, how can I help? And right. it's, a, you know, it's a relationship, it's a human interaction that, that tries to you know, share specific advice and specific feedback for that specific campaign to make it better. It's why we have the highest success rate in towards crowdfunding. But that's not, that's not magic and that's not because our tools are somehow different or better. It's just because we kind of work a bit harder, but that then breaks the crowdfunding business model. Um, and so the truth of it is that we could never quite make that work for us because it involved compromises we weren't willing to make, you know, letting too many people sink or swim and ultimately, you know, too many people sinking mm -hmm. that we just weren't willing. And, and that, and I guess that, that mindset has just continued to lead us into doing more and more around that coaching and capacity building space. Because you can only do so much when someone rocks up to a crowdfunding platform. You know, you can provide the best advice you can, but obviously they think they're launch ready or else they wouldn't be there in most cases. And they want to launch in a week or two. So you have, you have, you have a week or two potentially to help them. Sometimes it's a day or two. You know, sometimes people arrive and they're like, I'm launching tonight. I have a launch party already organized. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's only so much you can do in that time. You can help them tighten their pitch. You can help them think through their target market a bit in, in, a, in a more strategic way. Um, but we realized that having helped, as you said, 1,100 projects successfully launch and thousands of helping thousands of people try to launch and having seen the successes and the failures, we felt like we had a really, um, you know, a, re a, a really uh, strong idea of what it looked like to be ready to launch. Mm -hmm. What were the characteristics of the projects that succeed? But the time to share those characteristics is earlier. We thought not a week or two before you're kicking off your crowdfunding campaign, but these are kind of these are foundational building blocks that you should be thinking about in the design stage of designing your, your social enterprise or your impact project or your community organization or whatever it is uh, right from the start. And so we wanted to, I guess, connect with people earlier and help them really put those, put those key pieces in place so that when they come to crowdfunding or any other launch strategy, it's not about pushing people towards crowdfunding. It's just, crowdfunding is just one of many possible pathways that we introduce to them. But if they do choose to go um, into crowdfunding or any other launch approach, that they are in fact ready to share mm. their idea with the right people in the right way to create the right response that they need to make progress and make impact. Mm. And so Good Hustle kind of reverse engineered everything we'd learned from helping people crowdfund into kind of 10 key steps 
that you need to get right in order to build a, a launch or growth ready social enterprise or social impact project. Hmm. And uh, I, I don't mean you to mean for you to reveal all the secrets of the, the Good Hustle program, but I, I'd love to, to take those steps back and talk uh, at um, a greater depth as to what, what are some of those foundational uh, building blocks that you're talking about for someone to actually be adequately prepared to start and launch their, their social enterprise or social impact project. Yeah, no, very happy, very happy to share that when, when everyone <laughs> I figured. Talking about this. Yeah. Um, so we, we kind of break those 10 weeks into, into five, five key modules hmm. uh, of two weeks each. Um, and there's a very intentional uh, kind of sequence to those. So the first is all about the change you seek. And so it's about understanding, you know, the social, social enterprise models and impact models, and ultimately about really crafting your theory of change. And that's quite intentional that we start with impact first. You know, I think social enterprise pro uh, kind of programs can go in two different directions. Some focus on the business. Make sure you have a, a sustainable business first and then think about how you can kind of add impact mm. to that business. Um, and we think, make sure you're making an impact first. Make sure that you're, you know, that what you've designed is actually what the world needs and what the community needs. And then figure out how to build a business model around that to make it sustainable. Uh, and that's quite intentional because I think when you start with business model first and then do impact, you almost always end up with fairly shallow approaches to impact. Impact becomes we're going to give you know, uh, some of our profits away to charities or we're going to buy fair trade coffee beans uh, for our cafe or restaurant or you know, um, we're going to give our staff a week of volunteer time mm -hmm. a year. That's all awesome stuff. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to poo-poo any of those things, but all of those are kind of plug-ons on top. And what we really believe is that social enterprise impact has to be at the heart of the organization, you know, that you have an impact model at the very core uh, mm. of the business you're building around it. So we start with that and that's, you know, issue mapping, but understanding the issue that you're, that you're focused on, understanding the different places you can intervene in that issue. So, you know, let's say you're passionate about, I don't know, getting plastics out of the ocean. There's obviously so many different places you can intervene in that. You could, you know, you could convince people to stop using straws and use bamboo straws instead. You could create new types of plastic-like materials that but which are biodegradable using algae or seaweed you could try and get local government to ban plastic bags um in your community you could set up a, a you know a reusable shopping bag exchange as a very simple project out the front mm -hmm. of the shopping center you could um you could focus on getting plastics that are in the oceans back out of the oceans again so beach cleanups ocean cleanups you could take those materials and turn them into something that's economically productive, so taking recovered plastics and turning them into, we had a great um, swimwear label that launched with us recently called Oceans and Bikinis, mm. and all their stuff's made out of plastics recovered from the oceans. So you gotta kinda understand where are the different places, you know, if, uh, that's something I care about, but how, how, what are the different options I have to be? And then thinking about, you know, how do I build a, a business model out of, around that? So module two is all about designing the business. So it's, a, you know, teaching human-centered design, how you engage with customers, how you co-design with your target community and customers, how you test ideas, uh, and what are the huge, you know, what are the variety of different possible business models out there? Uh, you know, even even for doing the same thing, you, know, you could have, I don't know, bamboo straws as a service that turn up every month versus mm -hmm. one-off retail versus selling to restaurants. And that's just, that's just thinking about straws. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third module is building your tribe. So that's really getting really clear on who it is you're trying to reach and what are the hooks that are going to work for them. Who's your ideal uh, customer avatar? Um, and also who are your key partners? Because I think uh, often people think too much in terms of I need money to pay for X rather than who already has X that mm -hmm. might be willing to support me and back me. Um, and so there's a wonderful uh, module taught by a woman named Hildy Gottlieb, who's the founder of Creating the Future, based in uh, Arizona. But um. New Mexico, one of those two, uh, <laughs> called Collective Enoughness, which again is about mapping those stakeholders and figuring out who already has the assets you need and maybe there's ways to access them before you need to pay for them through partnership and other alliances. And then module four is all about your launch strategy, getting launch ready. So it's crafting your story. It's, you know, really, really figuring out what makes a great pitch, a pitch coaching, um, how to use social technologies, how to, how to use video, low cost, but high impact video production. And then the final module uh, we call The Road is Long. And it's about the personal dimensions of entrepreneurship, it's about personal sustainability and resilience. Because no matter how awesome your plan is, like I said right at the start, this is certainly my experience, it's probably going to take longer and be harder than you originally anticipated for right. most people. Um, and so it's really important, we think, up front to really think meaningfully about, and it's something so many entrepreneurs don't think about, what's your personal self-care routine? What are the kind of rituals and structures you need in your life to be sustainable and act, you know, to be at your best? And then how can you also build a company? 
that embodies those those principles and has that that kind of vibrant sustainable productive culture internally as well as hopefully a vibrant sustainable impactful business model and activities externally hmm. and, and so uh, amongst all those things what do you what do you feel like are um specific components that are, are most underestimated or maybe uh, uh, most surprising to mm. these very early stage, you know, n- new social impact yeah. uh, driven entrepreneurs. What, what are they most surprised by in going through this, this program? Let me just say a lot of the people who do join it are not necessarily brand new. We actually, we were designing it for people kind of from the start, but what, what's ended up happening is actually quite a few people joining who are somewhat further into their journey, but it's not quite working, you know, so they have launched mm. and they're a year or two in, but it's, you know, it's a struggle. It's a grind. They're maybe still, they've still got maybe another job. They're still not paying themselves properly. You know, they're worried about burning out. If they're not sustainable and they know they need to kind of step back and go back to the drawing board. And mm-hmm. so this is kind of gives them that opportunity to, you know, as I say, work on the business rather than in it by thinking, and they may not need all 10. Unlike someone who's at the very beginning, they may need every step, but mm-hmm. a lot of these people kind of come in so that they can help identify what's the piece that is letting me down. And I'll tell you that the piece that I think lets so many social entrepreneurs down is that definition around who your customer and who your community is. Mm. A lot of social entrepreneurs have universal goals. I mean, so do, so do I. You know, my goal is that everyone everywhere has the opportunity to make a difference. Uh, you know, so we're building, I um, mean, our, our outcome that we're, trying to, that we're trying to get to is, uh, is to increase the pace of innovation for social change. But how we think we do that is building a world where everyone can contribute to change making. Everyone has the... The, the confidence, the, the encouragement, the skills, the opportunities yeah. that, um, to make a difference, to get the ideas that we are convinced, all the ideas we need are out there. There's mm-hmm. just so many of them stuck in someone's head who doesn't know how to get them out. Um, and so I think that a lot of people come in with something like that, this universalist kind of theory of the case. I mean, you might see on the, well, this is not so good for radio, but <laughs> on, the wall behind, on the wall behind me is, a, is the sustainable development goals, mm-hmm. um, which I'm a big fan of. Every single one of them is universalist quality food for everyone, you know, quality employment for everyone. And so I think it's really easy as a social entrepreneur to think in terms of those universal terms. We want all plastic out of the oceans. We want all jobs to, um, to, to be well paid, et cetera, et cetera. And those are of course wonderful goals, but there's a difference between your ultimate goals and your impact aspirations and the community that you're building. Mm. And no matter how universal you think the thing you're building is, the community you're building first is not everyone. You know, even if in theory, everyone needs this, everyone should use this, that doesn't constitute a target market. It's okay. Who, who needs it and knows they need it and is willing to try a new thing is the, is the audience you might be working on. If you're launching something new, it's got to be a cross section of the people you know need it with, the, with people who also recognize that themselves and also have that willingness to go early on a new product or service, you know, the early adopter mindset. Um, and then it might be within a specific geography that you plan to service or launch. And then it's, you know, and you, so you need to get really hyper specific waiting to succeed, um, in, in any kind of a launch. Um, and that's, I think a piece that a lot of people don't invest enough time or thinking about. They, they are so convinced that everyone needs this. Everyone should have this. It's like, you know, you're not, you're not wrong, but mm-hmm. you're just not giving yourself an actual chance to succeed. Um, ultimately, cause not everyone will recommend, not everyone will agree with you. Not everyone will recognize it. Not everyone is as easily accessible. Not everyone can afford it. Mm. Um, not everyone is adventurous enough to try a new product for a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and so you've got to really think carefully about all those characteristics until you come down to a much tighter, like we, we, we're really big believers in a kind of a, a market persona mm. approach. If you're familiar with that, where you try and define your target market as a single person, can you get that specific? What are the kind of super specific characteristics? And if you can do that, obviously it won't end up being a single person. They'll end up being a bunch of people that meet those characteristics. Um, but you've got to get hyper, hyper focused in that way. Mm. And so that's certainly something we see a lot with crowdfunding, a lot of great ideas. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a quality idea. I'm sure there are people out there who would get excited about it. You just haven't spent the time to really think about who are those people and importantly, then how to reach them. Mm. Well, and then I guess uh, abridging a bit to that, um, you know, with a, a more specific uh, target market identified, what, what are some preliminary steps you recommend to, to folks uh, to actually execute on, on building that community and bringing those people around their idea, their, their new business, their mission. I mean, in general, we're a big believer in just get out there and start talking to people. Mm-hmm. You know, you, I still mean, this is not a common mistake, but it is one you come across, come across fairly regularly. people who are, you know, who think their idea is a secret, mm-hmm. that their idea is, is so special, so profound that it, as soon as they share it with anyone, that person is also going to see it as this precious idea and run off and try and take it. 
Mm. And that honestly almost never happens. I mean, if it's an actual technology breakthrough, we're going to get a patent or something. But in general, you know, the people I meet who, who have this concern hardly ever have an idea that is genuinely kind of patentable or unique. Um, I think the greater challenge is that they're not thinking about, they're thinking too much about this downside of someone liking their idea so much they'll steal it. The greater downside, the more likely downside is that no one will care at all. Is that, you know, no, no one will want to steal your idea because you won't actually be able to engage, you, know, you won't be able to inspire anyone and no one will be, no one will be paying attention to what you're doing. Um, and so the only way to know what's resonating is of course to, to be getting out there and to be sharing the idea with people and seeing how they react and, and you know, testing how you're talking about it and, and just discovering what are the kinds of people mm. who really respond to this. Um, and so that's a mix, I think, of just kind of what big believers is just as, at the earliest possible stage, go find your tribe. You know, if you're a, you know, are there groups of social entrepreneurs, are there co-working spaces, meetup groups, online communities, um, you know, particular Twitter hashtag conversations and so on, that you, you should get involved in all of those at the earliest possible stage, even before your idea is, is ready at all for, for prime time. And start building up those, those communities of allies, people who share your passions, people who also are really focused on getting plastics out of the oceans. You know, there are huge Facebook groups and podcasts and all sorts of communities that are focused on that. Don't wait until you have this perfect idea to, to pitch to them. Start, start, you know, start being an active member of that community so that when you do have that idea, you hopefully have some credibility, you have allies, you have people who trust you and want to be on the journey with you. Mm. Um, and so I, you know, as people ask me a lot, obviously, when, you know, how do I know if I'm more ready? And I, and I, I usually say, you'll know from the people around you. Mm. Are there people who share your excitement? Do you have partners? Do you have influencers and other organizations who are excited about what you're doing and want to endorse it? Do you have customers who can't wait for you to launch? Are you launched yet? I want to buy it. Um, you know, do you have people wanting you on their podcast to talk more about it? Um, if you don't have any of those things, um, you're probably almost certainly not launch ready. Um, and what's probably lacking is one of two things, or well, one of three things I would say, actually. I was going to say clarity or, cred or credibility, but actually courage is sometimes the thing that's lacking to get out there and actually even find out if you have enough courage, uh, if you have enough clarity and credibility. But if you're out there talking to people and they're not getting excited and they don't want to be on the journey with you, it's probably because you either lack clarity about what you're trying to do, you know, that really clear theory of change, that really clear, insightful description of what's going on in the world and why this particular intervention is needed, mm. that clear understanding of who it's for and the value proposition for that participant or customer or beneficiary, or credibility. You're clear, I just don't believe you. Mm. You know, so clarity is what allows me to understand you, but credibility is what allows me to go, oh yeah, this person knows what they're talking about and they seem like they're going to make it happen. Um, and people want to be on the side of, there's this kind of slight paradox, I think, with kind of community building, where people want to be on the side of people who look like they're going to succeed with or without them. In a way, you know, you meet people and you're like, this person's making it happen. They're really, they're, you know, they're, they're cool. They, they, they're passionate. They're driven. They have a direction. Um, I want to go with them. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to get on that journey because that seems like it's going in an exciting direction. Um, and so, you know, the, there's no way, there's no way for that. There's no possible way to, to, to build that community if you're not getting out there and, and sharing with people. So a big believers in that. And then as you get more focused, you know, using some of those kind of uh, human centered design type principles of, of constantly testing and iterating and trying to design with customers you have in mind mm -hmm. rather than designing for them. Because designing for people can be such a trap um, where you think you know what they need. If it's not you, you know, it's why, why I always have a lot of confidence when people are solving their own problems. Mm. You know, I like, I like, that, I like that, that kind of model of entrepreneurship where you're like, I have experience. And in a way, start some good as that. I had experience trying to raise early stage capital. I had experience trying to launch ideas and new ideas uh, that I was convinced were really good. And I was like, this is harder than it should be. How, would, how could it be better? What, what did I need 10 years ago, five years ago, when I was kicking off these new things? It's like, I wish I'd had access to a crowdfunding platform that was, you know, impact, impact focused. And I wish someone had taught me how to use it. Um, so I, it always gives me a bit of confidence when people are designing for themselves because I figure they're not so unique. To, you know, if that's a problem you have and a solution you need, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's at least some number of people out there in the same situation. But if you're designing for others who are who are living, you know, who are not who who are experiencing challenges you yourself don't experience, if you're not designing with them, you could be going off on a on a, on a you know down a cul-de-sac that doesn't lead anywhere. Right. Yeah, I mean, so many good things you, you mentioned there with the, the importance of, of building that community. Uh, I mean, that's been such a priority for us here at Grow Ensemble, too, is to think about, you know, bringing those people around you first and foremost, just because it's so much easier to have people to bounce ideas off of, to ask for yeah. feedback on, you know, new initiatives and projects. That's why we like things like content, you know, production in this, yeah. this wild, deep world of the internet. 
uh, with podcasting, blogging, all that kind of good stuff. Cause it's a way to, you know, build that community, especially in a moment right now, you know, COVID yeah. uh, where, you know, we, we uh, can't do so much face to face, but um, totally. as well, you know, you mentioned that, that building with folks, it just finished a uh, manifesto for a moral revolution. Uh, Jacqueline Navarro's new book. Yes. Uh, and, and she, that's a, a really important kind of concept in, in her kind of theory of change as well. So mm. that, that's, it's either scratching your own itch or, or being deeply immersed, it seems, in the community in which you're trying to serve. Uh, so yes, exactly. Closer. I think those are the only two. Exactly. If you, you, have to be, you have to be an expert. You know, you have to, mm. there's a, a great phrase, I can't remember who, who I heard this from first or who I'm stealing this from, but which I really like, called, which is that you have to apprentice yourself to the problem. Mm. Um, and actually, a good rule of entrepreneurship that, I, again, I can't remember who I'm lifting this from. I, I didn't invent this, but, <laughs> but is you want to be more in love with the problem than you're in love with your solution. Because mm. your solution's probably wrong. You know, your pro solution probably needs some sort of, you know, our solution didn't work the way we intended, you know, the platform on its own. We ended up having to kind of do all this other stuff around it to begin to kind of achieve what we wanted to achieve. Um, and so you can't, some people get completely in love with their solution. I mean, that could be a trap. You have to be in love with the problem. Like, in other words, right. deeply passionate about the actual, you know, about, about helping people out of poverty, about helping people take change, about getting plastics out of the ocean, not just deeply passionate about bamboo straws. Mm. They may or may not ultimately be the most right. powerful, scalable way to get plastic out of the ocean. So, um, but I do think, and, but I think you see this a lot in the commercial startup world as well, which is particularly like technologists, they get in love with their technology. Mm. And so they're in love with this particular thing they've built and they think it's so super cool but they're more in love with that thing than they are with the actual kind of issue that it's designed to address. So I think, you know, if you're going to apprentice yourself to the problem, you either need to be living it or you need to go spend time with people who are. Mm. I don't think there's any other way. Right. And then, I mean, exactly that, like you said, that comfort with more so the problem allows you to be comfortable with refining and adapting your solution. And then it will look yeah. completely different in a few years than it, than it did when you first hypothesized what was yeah. what was the solution in the first place um totally. well tom I, I really really appreciate your time but before we finish up can i ask you a few uh rapid fire questions yeah let's do it i'll, I'll do right. my best i'm not very good at rapid fire responses well you know right. take your time no <laughs> they're only called those so yeah. um uh you mentioned you know this these habits of of self-care and as well uh nurturing this resilience and sustainability as a as a, a impact driven entrepreneur and so what what are maybe some daily habits morning routines that uh, apply to this uh, thought or principle for yourself for me yeah. yeah i mean that's one of those classic things where i wish i was uh, <laughs> <laughs> Go as good at this uh, applying this to my own life as i am sure. about uh, encouraging others and uh, coaching others uh but no my, my big thing though is i i go for walks i, I get away from the screen um, every day. Um, I'm a bit of a slave to my Fitbit. Um, but that's helped me, I think, build a build a really strong habit around walking, particularly now, you know, there's if I wasn't if I wasn't careful now I'm working, you know, I've been working from home the last few months, you can just kind of not move at all. You know, right. get locked into your laptop for a long day and then stumble away from it, go to the kitchen, to eat, and it kind of I think you, you end up in a bit of a fog, I think, when you're just constantly in it like mm -hmm. that. Um, and so I go for a couple of walks a day normally. Um, one of them might be timed up with some some phone calls and some phone meetings, but I'll try and keep one of them clear just to think about what's going on at the moment and give my brain a chance to kind of work on those things in a less structured, focused way. Mm. I think when we're talking about innovation, you know, I'm a little bit believe that we do need that space to allow our, our mind to work on problems. And sometimes the trick to speeding up is to slow down because you know when you're just kind of bashing away at the problem sometimes it's really intractable like i gotta solve this i gotta solve this i gotta fix this whatever it is um and sometimes it seems paradoxical but the key to, to getting breaking through that situation is to step away from it and just give your brain a chance to kind of make some liminal um uh, subliminal connections um and so that's that's kind of my main thing is i, I just try and make sure i, I get my steps so get away from the screen um, I get a little, I'm very fortunate that I live in a, a beautiful part of Sydney down by the harbour with some kind of remnant native bushland on some, some headings. I'm able to kind of get in you know, five minutes from here. I can kind of be surrounded by bush, mm. which is, which is wonderful. So that's, that's the key thing for me. Um, I used to do, you know, I used to have uh, probably better habits and routines. Uh, the, the struggle of, you know, startup plus, plus kids is not, yeah, <laughs> is, is, is such a, is a real challenge to uh, an attempt to build really structured routines and habits um, but I do my best I eat with the family every night you know I'm kind of family also provides kids provide mm. a pretty powerful balance as well because I think that you want something in your life I think where you can be deeply present that is not work mm. 
Um, and now for me, it used to be music festivals and going out and listening to live music was massive for me all through my twenties. And I, I missed that. To be honest, I don't do enough of that anymore, but that was kind of that other space mm. where I wasn't at work and I didn't have to think about it in my brain, you know, and I was kind of in the moment with music and friends and so on. Kids kind of play a somewhat similar role now that, you know, when I'm out with my kids doing a bike ride or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm at least I'm trying to be, I, and I, I like to believe I mostly am pretty present with them mm. and not, not thinking about all the other stuff I have to get done. That's the goal anyway. Hmm. Excellent. I mean, it, it seems that that point of like intentional rest or intentional time mm. away. Uh, yeah. From... I did one other thing actually that I, I think mm. that, that I mentioned, which is so I, I, I listen to a lot of books. I used to read a lot and then I got out of the habit of reading and then audio books have been really good for me in terms of getting me back into, into consuming books. But I have this particular, I don't know, I have this funny um, genre maybe of books that I listen to a lot or used to read a lot, which is people having a really hard time. Um, so I basically run out of good mountaineering books, you know, and a good mountaineering books is never just, we, we climbed the mountain and everything went perfect. It's obviously there's some, there's some right. disaster for Bell people, they broke a leg, they're down a crevice. Um, I've run out of books about the, the, the romantic age of exploration in Antarctica, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the people that the race to the South pole and so on. I've recently read a bunch of books of autobiographies and biographies of like child soldiers in the Sudan, mm. even like pretty heavy stuff. But I think, I think it's become a habit for me to try and to, to, it helps me contextualize my own struggles. You know, startups can feel super intense sometimes, like life or death. And I think it's really important to realize they're not. Mm. Well, actually life or death, I'm, I'm not stuck up a mountain running out of oxygen. I'm, right. I'm not been, my, my village has not been burnt and I've been dragged into a, a brutal civil war. Like my life is pretty great. And even if stuff's been good, didn't make it, my life would still be great. And I find other meaningful things to do. And I, you know, I live in a, a safe place with you know, a beautiful family and a, a roof over our heads. And, mm. um, I think, you know, I think that's my habit to kind of constantly try and reframe my own struggles as, you know, as not, not the most important thing in the world, um, mm. as pretty good, actually, <laughs> even, even on the stressful days, even the hard days, you know, really, that's kind of my weird, like kind of reverse gratitude exercise is that if I can constantly be reminded that there are people who right. have really hard times, you know, and really struggling, but you know, these are also mostly stories of human resilience and the triumph of the human spirit and, um, and, and all of that, that, that I find that. I think that's helpful for me uh, in mm. not getting too bogged down or too too anxious or too um, depressed even with with the you know, with the daily struggles that are, that that business can represent. Definitely, and and I guess bridging off of that, the the next question was going to be any any specific book titles that you could recommend. Maybe it's from one of those genres or not, but anything mm. come back to recommending or or one that's particularly impacted you recently. Yeah, I've got a couple. So the one that's impacted me recently, I've just read it. So this is a bit of a maybe a, a recency bias, but it's been on my mind a lot. I finished it a couple of weeks ago, and it's one of those books that I kind of have, I've, I think I've thought about every day since. Some books you finish and mm, right. more or less never think about them again. <laughs> they they might have been nice at the time, but this is one of the ones that's kind of really bouncing around my head, and it's called Surveillance Capitalism. Mm. It's a bit of a more intellectual, political, idea, political science, I'm interested in stuff, but it's, it's really fascinating, and I really recommend it to people. It's actually beautifully written, very lyrical in places. Um, but also a bit, you know, uh, quite dense. But it's looking at essentially that we have a new, you know, this whole new form of capitalism that's emerged, uh, led by Google and Facebook and so on, where people sometimes, you know, you hear people sometimes talk about that if you're, if you're not paying for it, you are the product. Mm. But it takes that step further. That actually, we're not, we're not even the products; we're the raw materials from which the products are mined, and the products are behavior modification. Right. You know, this world where we have all these giant tech companies surveilling us, tracking us. And then what's their business? Their business is actually trying to change what we then choose to do through advertising. You know, they essentially sell behavioral predictions mm. to the market. So their customers are people who want to change our behavior, commercial, political, as we're seeing. And it's kind of, I don't know, it really, it, it's really kind of, it's one of those things where, you know, a really brilliant book, a really brilliant kind of book around politics and sociology sometimes tells you what you already know, but puts it into, into a framework that makes sense. Like I can see all this stuff going on around me but I don't have a language or a synthesis to really understand what's going on. And so it's kind of took all these jigsaw pieces, but I know I've been surveilled. I know we've been tracked. I kind of, you know, we all kind of know bit pieces of this, but it kind of puts them together into this to suddenly make a picture out of all these jigsaw pieces. Oh, wow. That's what's really going on. Big picture. It is this whole, kind of whole new form of capitalism that's going on. It got me thinking a lot about during we were homeschooling for a bit there when the schools were closed in Australia, right. they were there as well. And all, all the kids got put, put on Google Classroom. So for the first time, my, my seven-year-old son had an account, his own logins, you know. Um, and it occurred to me, well, that's where it starts. Google now has a file on him. Mm -hmm. And he is literally going to be tracked 
through, uh, they're going to do their best to track every digital interaction he has and even getting more and more real world from this point onwards. And by the time he's 17, they will know him better than he knows himself and they will be able to manipulate him to an ex extraordinary extent if, when, if we don't build, you know, more transparency, if we don't take control of that data, if we don't build a lot of like, right. like uh, emotional intelligence and media literacy. Anyway, I really highly recommend that to anyone who's interested in technology, sociology, politics, and not the world, well, where the world is going. It's a, it's a fascinating, slightly disturbing, but important book. Um, some long-time favorites that I recommend. Um, I'm a big fan of entrepreneur and change maker autobiographies and biographies. Mm. In fact, you mentioned uh, Jacqueline Novogratz. I had the chance to talk to her at our recent summit. She's amazing. and I'm a huge fan of her, her previous book, her more autobiographical one, uh, The Blue mm -hmm. Sweater. Really recommend that in terms of the journey of a change maker, you know, uh, apprenticing themselves to the problem. So many of the, the things right. that we talked about. I love Let My People Go Surfing, mm. Yvon Chouinard, founder of Patagonia. Um, I love Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela's um, autobiography. I think is just an extraordinary document um, of someone, you know, trying to build a, a future his community deserves. Um, and then, then on a slightly more maybe personal inspiration book, a book that. Uh, Side, a book that meant a lot to me years ago and I do return to sometimes is called The Answer to How is Yes. Hmm. Um, I'm sitting around here somewhere, maybe I can find you the, the name of the, oh yeah, Peter, Peter Block. Um, and it's just this, this is the basic idea is that so often when we, you know, when we're talking about innovation uh, and, and social change, so, so often when people have a genuine visionary idea, it gets closed down by people saying how, hmm. how, 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 and that how is the wrong, you should kind of delay the how question. And focus on the, the the why and the what um and so the answer to how is yes simply means that the answer to how is it doesn't matter right now we you know we commit to it we don't know how it's going to work but we're determined mm. to move forward and that's what a lot of social change has to be we don't know how we're going to fix our democracy right now we don't know how we're going to feel we don't know how we're going to fix this digital media ecosystem we don't know how we're going to fix poverty we have some good ideas but um but if we simply if we simply wait until we have the perfect the perfect answer that answer would never come you only get there by trying things by kind of not letting the how bog you down by saying yes and moving forward and mm -hmm. trying stuff out so i think that's a that's a wonderful book it's a short book um but i i read it i don't know 10 years ago 12 years ago or something now and it's something that has stayed with me i, I recommend mm. excellent quite the quite the list we'll have on the the show notes and then uh, a tom final question for you what, what sort of parting piece of advice i know there's been so much of it uh, uh, woven throughout this chat already, but mm -hmm. maybe a, a parting piece of advice for the aspiring uh, change maker or, or social entrepreneur active from, or as well as aspiring uh, mm. before we sign off here. Well, particularly to those who are inspiring, uh, my advice is to just start. I know that seems cliche, but there really is nothing else for it. It kind of comes back to that idea of the how, answer to how is yes. You may not mm -hmm. know exactly how you're going to achieve the impacts you want yet. Um, but I don't think, you know, innovation, like ideas, well, sometimes they do, I guess, just emerge out of left field. But, you know, as, as Jacqueline said, when we were, when we were talking um, recently, uh, Jacqueline Novogratz, she said, our purpose doesn't find you on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. A lot of people wait, I think, for this striking inspiration until they know exactly what their purpose is, they know exactly how to live their purpose. And they're kind of waiting for this bolt, you know, of sunlight through the clouds to illuminate them and illuminate the path forward. And that's not how it happens. You know, Jacqueline mm -hmm. got started by just kind of, moving to Africa and throwing herself into it and, just, and, and, and figuring out what, what, what would happen. You know, I, I got started as a high school student, just gathering a group of friends and saying, how do we get more of our peers thinking about politics and the future and change mm. um, and, and going from there. Uh, Start some good got started because we were like, this crowdfunding thing looks interesting. Let's, let's see, let's give it a go and, and, and launch something. And, you know, the journey since then has been very different from what I anticipated at the start. Mm. Um, so I think if you are sitting on the sidelines, if you are waiting for that moment, um, I think just, just get started, start meeting people, start listening. I mean, you're listening to this podcast by definition. So you, that's already an important step, you know, start, start, start consuming the stories of others who are on the path. Um, I think start building that community around you, start, start being part of the, the communities that already exist. Um, so don't, don't let your uncertainty hold you back. None of us know what the future will hold. The future is deeply uncertain. Um, but the only way we create the future that we all want and need and deserve is by taking purposeful action now. Wonderful advice to close on. And, and Tom, where specifically should we direct folks outside of start some good site? Is there anything you want to uh, uh, immediately recommend or direct folks to? Well, I'd love them to check out our Good Hustle program. Um, that's at a goodhustle.online. Um, 
As mentioned, that's a cohort-based 10-week program to help you design a launch or growth-ready social enterprise. Um, what's unique about that program is that you're learning from and with other social entrepreneurs. Mm. So we every every module is taught by a founder of a, of a social enterprise, which I think is really unique. And so while we have kind of as I said, put together the kind of structure and steps, we're not the experts at all of those. We've brought in people who we think are some of the best in the world to teach their particular piece, whether that's mm. videography or, or pitching or human-centered design or building customer avatars. Um, and then, of course, the people that you're there in the community with, you know, we're talking about finding your tribe and being part of the community. That's such a core part of the design of Good Hustle is that it is cohort-based. You are working through the program with a group of peers, and there's a lot of peer learning and peer interaction as well. So please check that out, and I'd also welcome anyone to connect with me and, and, and make me part of your tribe and your community if you're, if you're, if you're you know, working towards social impact. I would love to connect with you. The best places to, to, to connect with me personally is on Twitter, where I'm Tom JD, or on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash in slash Tom Dawkins. And you're very welcome to connect with me in either of those places. Uh, right. If you do connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, say that you uh, heard me on this podcast and I'll approve it. Right. Those personal notes are very important on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, Tom. Well, thank you so much for the time. Uh, looking forward to, to sharing this with everyone. Thanks so much, Corey. It's been a real pleasure.